Right, your three minutes are up. Can I ask you to take your seats, please? Our second speaker this afternoon is the Humanitas Professor in Contemporary Art. Uh, the Humanitas Chair in Contemporary Art is supported by Ivory Press, and we are immensely grateful to them for bringing our speaker to Oxford. The Financial Times selected our Humanitas Professor, Shirin Nishat, as one of the most influential women of 2011. It described the Iranian artist and filmmaker as an eloquent commentator on the Middle East, lending her powerful voice to the Arab Spring. Shirin was born in Iran, but educated in the US and for many years has lived in New York. Her work is concerned with women's experience in contemporary Islamic societies, and as a photographer and video artist, she has been recognized for her portraits of women overlaid with Persian calligraphy, notably with her Women of Allah series. Subsequently, she's directed a number of video pieces. Uh, we're going to see one of them, memorably turbulent. Oh, good, I'm glad I said that. Memorably turbulent and rapture, which won the International Prize at the 1999 Venice Biennale. She won the Silver Lion at the Venice Film Festival in 2009 for her first feature film, Women Without Men, which examines the 1953 coup which installed the Shah, and is currently working on her second feature film, about the Egyptian singer Um Kaltoum. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome her to Oxford and to invite her to speak on images and history. Shireen. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to admit, I've never been called a professor before. This is really shocking, and particularly being in this incredible University of Oxford. Thank you very much for everyone who's been responsible to invite me to bring me here, Mr. President, Paul Bonaventura, Christine Ferdinand, and Mr. and Mrs. Norman Foster. I, I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, actually, last night, as myself and my partner were here, I felt like I was walking in the film set of Harry Potter. I immediately texted my son in New York and said, oh, you can't believe where I am. Uh, it's very beautiful. Um, I would like to seduce you by taking a pause of words and indulge in looking at a work of art for 10 minutes, uh, and, and then I'll come back and briefly speak with you. So if it's all right with you, I would like to show you one of my earliest videos, perhaps my first video, Turbulent, that was shot in 1998, uh, and I uh, would come back to you immediately after that. Uh, I think we dim the light.
of emotions. Can you hear me? I am happy to say that the singer of that uh, video is here, Shoja Azari, who has been my longtime collaborator ever since uh, Turbulent. I fell in love with him. And uh, <laughs> here he is. <laughs> and so it, it's a very um, a turning point piece uh, for me. Um, you know, as I was preparing for this talk, I realized that um, how to share my process and the evolution of my work best for you without really overwhelming you uh, in terms of the amount of work that I've produced. Um, and I realized that since we're in the context of the university, perhaps what's most interesting uh, and significant is to focus on the central point about my work, the evolution of my work, which is the transitional behavior that my work has seen ever since I began as an artist. From photography to video to cinema, experimenting with theater and uh, live performance, and currently I'm working with a ballet, a Dutch national ballet, for making them my first ballet piece on The Tempest from Shakespeare. So I often ask myself, um, you know, why so much transition? And perhaps this could be helpful since we have many art students here. And, and I, I try to understand, are these transitions, these changes, because I'm overly ambitious, or I'm very brave and fearless, or I have uh, some power or something like that? And I realize, no, that with artists, uh, as I think we all agree, that their artwork, in a way, mirrors their personality and who they are. And I started to think about myself and how I'm utterly a restless, nervous, anxious person, and that I've always seemed to see this pattern of rebelling against everything that I ever construct in my life. Uh, every signature work that I've made, I've rebelled against it. I'm an artist who always needs new beginnings. Uh, I, I, I can never stay very long at any place. And, and, and also that I seem to thrive in this idea of a struggle. Uh, it seems to me that when I look back, that every time I've struggled, I seem to, to keep on my toes. That sometimes I go intuitively out of my way to embrace an idea of a struggle, just so I feel I'm relevant, I feel alive, and that I'm growing. And I think this seems to me such a significant part of being an artist today. And the opposite, the absence of struggle, for me, feels like stagnation. Uh, another thing that seems to, to be a reflective uh, of this transitional behavior, perhaps, is my own personal nomadic life. Ever since I've known myself as a young adult, I was sent abroad by my family as an immigrant to the United States. I've only learned how to be a traveler, a person who keeps moving from one place to another. I can't even remember the last place where I, I looked like everyone else and I spoke the same language as everyone else. I've always been unlike everyone else and I've learned to, to be unfaithful to any culture, any language, any flavor of food and any music, uh, anything. I just keep moving. Uh, and, and it seems to me that has been an element that has been absolutely influential uh, subconsciously in the way that I go about choosing my forms. Now, while I keep changing and my work seems to be taking different forms, there seem to be certain elements that continue to be constant and a pattern in my work. And, and they all start with P, poetry, politics, the notion of paradoxical and personal. <coughs> personal because I think, unlike what other people think of my work, my work is rooted really on my own personal dilemmas as a human being. It's as much about existential questions of me on this planet and facing with very profound existential questions that I have as a woman, as, as a human being, as much as it has to do with my social anxiety about the world I live in. So in a way, the work becomes, uh, my imagination becomes a place where I absolutely feel at home and feel safe and feel a place where I could indulge in this dialogue between my inner, outer world. It happens to be that the outer world that is in crisis really profoundly affects my personal life. The question of politics. I think it is almost impossible to be an Iranian today, to be an Iranian artist today, and not have your psyche and your work somehow intersect the question of politics. Our very lives have been defined by the question of politics. 
If you're living in Iran, you're dealing with censorship, oppression, arrest, torture sometimes. Um, and if you're living outside, like myself, you're subjected to a life in exile and, and ultimately lack of access to your beloved land and your family. So you pay a great due, uh, and, and, and never mind that being in Europe or in the United States, I've always felt also an additional conflict as an outsider, as a Muslim, etc., etc. So I would easily say that as an Iranian woman artist, I don't find the emotional, moral, philosophical, or political option to distance myself from the question of politics, and I wish I could. And I often envy the Western artists who have that choice. The question of poetry that seems to be inevitable aspect of my work, whether it's a photograph, a film, a video, um, whatever I do is deeply rooted in the poetic language that I really believe that is inherent in Iranian blood. When you look back at Iranian history, particular modern history, an atrocious history, a very dark history, Iranian people seem to have embraced the language of poetry as the most subversive way to cope and deal with the world that they're living with. It's the only place where they could really say everything behind, beyond the lines. And I think even though I live outside, I've always depended on the language of metaphor and poetry to say everything that I could not say overtly. And the question of paradoxical, I seem to operate always in the sense that everything to me exists in the sense of duality, in terms of paradoxical. Everything is always in the state of between. And maybe that has something to do with my nomadic life. If you look at my work visually and, and conceptually, they're always embracing an idea of opposites. Visually, it's about black and white, men and women, nature and culture, magic and realism. Conceptually, it's about emotions, and rational, mystical and political. And, and it's about religion and politics and atrocities. And uh, endless cycles that I would really bring out as we look at each one of the series. Now, again, not to exhaust you, since I really have been producing a lot of work since I became active only in, in the 90s, after I basically abandoned art for about 10 years after graduating from School of Art. Um, this first series I will share with you is a series of portraits called The Woman of Allah. Woman of Allah basically was really my return to Iran after being absent for 12 years. When I studied, the, the revolution happened, and about 12 years I didn't go back, and finally I did. And now for the past, since 1996, I'm not allowed to go back. But be, prior to that, I did for some time. The Woman of Allah, to be very brief, again, I don't want to expand too long on any of the series, but again, focus on the transitional aspect of my work. It really focuses on the Islamic Revolution. It focuses on the point of view of an artist, of a woman, Iranian woman, who has been living outside and has almost like a neutral point of view regarding what had transpired in, in Iran while I was absent. To go further, I was very interested in the notion of martyrdom, which to me became a central and fundamental aspect of understanding the Islamic Revolution, in the way that a martyr stood simultaneously in that intersection of love of God, devotion to faith, yet cruelty, violence, and ultimately death. How this concept of martyrdom had become almost institutionalized by the government for me was fascinating. Again, at this moment, I was not in a position to, to, to be um, pointing fingers, uh, any of that. It was more for me a curiosity as someone who was absent during the Islamic Revolution to comprehend the basic philosophical and ideological um, elements of the Islamic Revolution. And to make it more complex, I found it fascinating that the woman's role in relation to the Islamic Revolution and even the subject of martyrdom, how indeed women were very active in the military. So it created yet another sense of paradoxical for me. So I, at the time, began a body of work, simply uh, really the most minimalistic approach that I could take, reducing my elements to the female body, most controversial, and problematic, 
to the text which became poetry, expressions of voices of the women who had, who had spoke out about the revolution. And the veil, of course, being a very important symbol from the Islamic revolution and Islamization, both a symbol of oppression and yet liberation and rejection of the West. And of course, the weapon suggesting the violence. Eventually, I was accused of all kinds of things by this series, people who, who suggested that I was against the Islamic Revolution, people who said I supported the Islamic Revolution and I was sensationalizing the idea of violence. Um, but I insist again that this work are almost nostalgic, romantic point of view of an Iranian that desperately wanted to make a bonding with her lost country. And more so, at the time, all of my friends had been part of the process of the revolution at my generation, and I had been absent. So there was this incredible sense of nostalgia. And this body of work embarked this process, the journey of me returning to Iran, if not physically, psychologically, and philosophically, and politically. I returned to New York, committed to, to continue this dialogue, and never allowed this tie to be broken again. At the same time, now talking about the form, if there was something very monumental and, and static about those photographs that you saw, that there was devoid of the landscape and they became all these controlled figures that through the gaze and simple body languages, I was trying to say everything, uh, I felt a certain frustration with photography. I was introduced to video in, in, and it became an incredibly liberating experience that I no longer had to be so rigid and so sculptural, that I could create moving pictures that not only became no longer an object and became more experiential, and yet, and they could still be aesthetically very similar to my photograph, but they could move, they could tell a story, they could incorporate landscape, they could have music, they could have choreography, and that I could communicate to my audience in a whole new way. In fact, this piece, Turbulent, is not the way you have just seen it. For some of you who have seen it in museums, it's two opposite projections in two opposite walls where you are literally, as an audience, are divided between the two, and you're constantly having to shift your attention between the male singer and the female singer. This is a very sculptural experience. Indeed, you, you, you cannot possibly see all things at the same time. So you become an active participant. My frustration with photography or art as object was that it became an, a really a shallow interaction with the piece, where with the video, if you manage to keep the audience in the room for that period, you really had a different kind of experience and impact. So nevertheless, this turbulence, which was my first video, became an opening into another world, got me out of the studio, again to the students, that studio art is such a solitary experience. With movie making and film, it's a collaborative team. And not only that, I found myself outside of the studio into the world, which is really shocking. And I must say, I've never worked uh, on a moving picture before. I, not only I never knew how to take a photograph, I didn't even know how to do video. But I Im Im immersed myself with a group of people who had the expertise, and we took ourselves to Morocco in 19... Oh, I'm sorry, The Woman of Allah was 1993 to 1997, Turbulent was 1998, and this was 1999. It was suddenly like I had woken up as a sleepy artist, and I wanted to make up for all those 10 years that I didn't do anything. So we went with Shoja and many of uh, our Iranian friends. And at this point, my surrounding became Iranian artists who lived in diaspora. We became a group, a team. Uh, and, and we went to Morocco and we made this video called Rapture. With Rapture, I found something tremendous. That I, for the first time, took my photographs and what I learned from Turbulent. But now I was doing almost like a dance. The way that this story of Rapture was constructed was it was one mass of people moving in one type of space, meaning a hundred men in white shirt in the space of a fortress, which is typically a masculine space, versus a hundred women in black veil in nature. If I had to say briefly about the concept, I was absolutely interested theoretically, in the, the question of women from Islam in relation to natural space. As most of us 
only imagine Muslim women in the context of la urban landscape. For me, it was very interesting to remove them from that urban landscape and throw them in nature, more so in opposition to a group of men who were in the fortress. And ultimately, the thread of the story was that the woman moved from the desert near the sea, eventually pushed a boat, got on it, and left, while the men stayed behind. Now, what I was saying about the way that I designed this piece was that in no time in this short piece, again, two simultaneous projections in two opposite walls, you never came to a close-up of a single person, man or woman. So it became a really about a choreography of a group of women versus a group of men. There was no protagonist. And, and this was a tremendous lesson for me in terms of using landscape and, and using human figures, choreography, and, and yet a little thread of a story. And also learning how to direct, which is something I'd never done before, and working with people who were skilled. 2000, this was 1999 Rapture, and this was uh, 2000. We made another film in Morocco. As you can imagine, we cannot shoot in Iran, so we are nomadic artists working in Mexico to Morocco, now in Egypt, in Turkey. This was also another piece in Morocco. In, uh, called fervor, and, and again, I don't want to expand too much on it, but this whole question of opposites, masculine and the feminine, uh, now taking another turn, which it really brought the question of temptation, desire, sexuality, another problematic uh, issue in the Islamic world. And here we had a protagonist, a male and female, that encountered each other and eventually found each other in this public domain where they were confronted with a speaker who resembled a mullah, maybe a theater actor, a preacher, we didn't know. But all it was that he was giving a speech to all these men and women how to refrain from, from temptation, the sense of desire, all of that is biologically given to us by God, but he was warning us of how to suppress everything that was naturally given to you. I found this subject immensely interesting, and, and I tried to create this video that really gave you that temptation that comes from a single individual versus a community, a social order that controls it and suppresses it. And by now, I could not go back to Iran, so I, my, my knife was getting a little um, harder or sharper. <coughs> Um, and this is another short film called The Last Word about a trial of a poet uh, facing her interrogators, which is briefly about my own last return to Iran when I was interrogated. And eventually I always wanted to make a video that brought me as the artist to confront the people who thought my imagination and my art was my crime. Um, another um, video, uh, we'll go more quickly, soliloquy shot in Turkey, the grand beautiful architecture of Islamic background to the grand beautiful architecture of the Western world. Um, this video again focused on a kind of paradox, but it's no longer about male and female, but East and West. This piece was called soliloquy and actually was purchased by Tate Modern and recently shown in, in England, in UK. Um, but again, um, I don't want to go on too much about it, but basically I performed in this piece myself and that you saw the same silhouette of a person carrying on in two worlds, two opposite worlds that were not just different but in complete conflict. And, and we really focused on architecture, and it's great to have Mr. Foster here as this great architect, how architecture expresses so much about the ideological um, sort of um, basis of a society. Uh, I was really after using architecture in the biggest way to express the, the conflicts and the, difference, the differences in the two different parts of the world. Uh, eventually, I collaborated with Philip Glass, a marvelous uh, American composer. It was a, another breakthrough for me to move from the double projections into single projection, to move away from Iranian composers like Susan Dehim was turbulent, that had sung in Turbulent. Now, with Philip Glass, I had to come up with a universal story that he, as a composer, could, could connect to, to, to feel affinity with and make a music with. Um, I ultimately, as I was embedded with the subject of death, funerals, as we saw Israel and Palestine were at war at that time, it was 
as, as they are today. This was back in 2000. My father passed away. My sister's young son that died. I was inundated with the question of mortality and death. So I ultimately made this film called Passage that also shot in Morocco that was really a, a ceremony that was an imaginary sort of fictional mm, funeral, a passage of a group of men carrying a corpse into the desert journey through the different landscapes toward a group of women in a circular shape digging the ground with their bare hands. And eventually the, the, the body arrived and they placed it in the center and a great fire broke out. This was one of the first pieces like I think Rapture as well where I really broke away directly from the question of politics. Something very primal and something very subconscious told me what to do in terms of the, the logic of why this linear formation of men, why the circular formation of the woman. Is this erotic? Is this something to say uh, about something? I, I, all I knew that was I trusted my intuition and also the use of fire, air, the blue sky, earth and water all of those elements that eventually one could associate the, to the religion of Zoroastrian, etc. But there was something about these pieces that I appreciated very much that departed from that kind of socio-political ideas and became truly existential. Um, it didn't stop. I continued every year going to Mexico now. I made this video called Tuba. Tuba is the name of the sacred tree, the tree in paradise. It's the only feminine tree that we have in the Quran. I was fascinated by how this tree represented the tree in paradise and in fact was a female tree, feminine tree. So after September 11th, looking for the type of metaphor that indirectly could express the notion, the desperation, the feeling that all of us, all over the planet, felt the sense of insecurity and the need for security and refuge refuge, and how the gardens and how the idea of orchards and trees suggest an idea of heaven and security, particularly in the Iranian society, in our tradition of literature and mysticism, the orchard, the garden, the tree is repeatedly looked upon as a place of heaven, a, a ref, replicate of paradise. So this video became uh, a relationship between a group of men and women in black. We worked with the native Indians in Mexico. Uh, a tree of tuba, and, and beautifully carved where a woman was, the, the tuba was in, inserted inside of the, the tree. Uh, and finally, um, these are some close-ups of her, uh, a group of men dressed in religious uh, in clothes that somehow these men suggested the people of power that basically controlled the destiny of these three parties. So it was the sacred, it was the mass of people, and finally the people of power. Okay, so by 2002, uh, after participating in endless amount of biennials and exhibitions and galleries and museums, I found a strong urge to move away from the art world. Again, this is the rebellious. I, I don't know what happened to me. I felt exhausted from making commodities. I felt exhausted by, by exclusivity of the art world in terms of when you enter a museum, you absolutely must have a preconceived idea of art history. No insult to any directors of museums here. I, I felt that I, as the activist, the one who always felt my work was close to the people, wanted to get closer to the grassroots, to the real people. And I felt with cinema, and as of course I had made some videos, I become slowly more narrative and falling more in love with the language of cinema. But truly I felt with with cinema, there was this possibility of democracy where people could buy like $10 ticket and go and be entertained and yet be given a, a, a film that took their attention but gave them a message and also was beautiful. For me, this was an immense challenge as a visual artist to think about entertainment, to think about pushing beyond galleries and museum walls and entering the mass culture. And, and, and I was wondering, could I really do that for someone who's never studied cinema? And mind you that up to now, my portraits and my videos were devoid of human character as say. All my images became kind of statues. The people had no character. They became representative 
of a country, of a culture, of religion. I never had learned ever to go inside the heart and the mind of the people. And I realized that is the difference between cinema and visual art. With visual art, you don't deal with the characters, at least in my understanding. With cinema, I had to learn how to go inside of uh, someone and learn the psychological aspect of a character, but also how to tell a story that had a beginning and middle and the end, but has a good pacing and it was entertaining. It took six years to make this film. It was no easy game. And I think I went through an education, I would say, like as if I went to study cinema. I took the most difficult book anyone ha could have possibly pick picked. It was called Woman Without Men, written, again, being obsessed by woman heroes. I had a hero, a woman writer, called Shahnusha Parsipur, who has been really tragic in my mind as an artist. She had paid great dues. She had been in prison five times, I think, once for five years. And this book, for me, it was monumental. And I think every Iranian people person has read this book. And this was a book that was banned, one of the reasons she was in prison. It's a book of magic realism that has a footing in nature, exploring some of the most existential, universal, timeless issues of a crisis of a few women who run to an orchard to find themselves, to really to question their own personal dilemmas. And yet it had a footing in the city of Tehran in 1953 when the British, with the help, the Americans with the help of the British had a coup d'etat organized that very, pretty much uh, overthrew the, the, the democratic leader of Iran, um, Dr. Mossadegh. If the book of Shahnush Parsipur did without the political part so much and basically hinted at it, I, being the one who was really interested in politics, took that part and expanded it, made it equal. So the film became the personal crisis of four women as they went to this orchard to find a form of transport transformation and the country of Iran as the fifth character that also looked for an idea of transformation, all of them looking for an idea of freedom and democracy and independence. So for me, this became a great poetry between the orchard and the city of Tehran about the country of Iran and the woman in the orchard. I could talk about this for two hours, I won't do that. Um, but the point was that with an incredibly tedious balance, how as a visual artist, to bring all of these ideas together of art and cinema, of politics and poetry, a woman and country, and, and, and more so, I didn't have the tools for it. I had to really be patient and learn my tools. And so I devoted six years for that. Now, this film ended up going to festivals. I worked with producers. I was no longer dealing with gallery dealers, but producers, distributors, fe film festival uh, directors. We won the, the, fest uh, the Venice uh, Biennial, um, the Silver Lion, which was an amazing honor because I suffered a lot to make this film. Again, I go back to this notion of struggle. At some point, I thought I had made a big mistake, that I didn't know what I was doing, but I never gave up with the help of Shoja, who co-directed the film. And so I was really proud, and it gave me a tremendous lesson in terms of always stay with your intuitions and have faith in yourself. Some of the images that you see are some of the characters in this film. Zarin is a prostitute, one of my favorite characters in the film. Um, prostitute, but the most sacred, the most saintly character of the film. The most torturous, but the most saintly. And to me, this is very close to the idea of mystics. And, and I think in Iranian tradition, we always think of a dervishes are the ones who suffered the most, but the, they're most wise and, and they're most sacred. And to me, I took Shahnusha Parsipur's character and I made them my own. I worked with um, Orshi, she, she's a Hungarian actress. She never spoke in the film once. She was always mute, obviously she couldn't speak Farsi, but, but also she was a tremendous actress who, again as an artist, who really wanted to do as much as I could without words, she said everything with her body language. These are in the brothels, um, some of the images of other characters that we employed in, to be in the, in the um, 
uh, in her story. As you can see, I was really inspired. I threw in a couple of images where I was looking at Jerome's painting of Orientalism, and this is what we created in, in, in the Marrakesh, in the Hammam, one of the scenes, scenes where uh, Orshi, who is actually anorexic and who begins to see her clients faceless and is inundated with a sense of shame and sin. She goes to the bathhouse to clean herself from her sins. And, and, and you'll see, uh, some of you may have seen the film, this beautifully painterly erotic images and yet you're faced with an anorexic woman who's bleeding. For me, this was the paradoxical, the pain, the suffering, yet the beauty, the elegance. And again, when I go, uh, when I, if you remember at the beginning, I see everything in this sense of paradoxical. And here again, we constructed that. Um, eventually, she dies. These are some of the images. I, I, I've separated the, the few characters just so you can see that each woman had a different nature, different, um, different dilemmas and different aspirations. For her was redemption. Basically, she asked for redemptions, and everywhere she went, she was not given the redemption, even in the mosque. Eventually, she goes to the orchard. And these are some of the um, images in the orchard. Um, for me, the orchard was very significant because if the city became like the, the outer body, the skeleton of human being, the orchard became the inner life, the, the life after uh, death, the feminine space, and the city of Tehran became the masculine space. Once you entered the orchard, time stopped. Even the sound changed it. We purposely used different camera movement. We, ha we had only natural sound. There was a strange mist. Um, there was something beautiful and yet haunting, uh, as if it was the Garden of Eden, where the women were given a chance to enter. But if they committed sin, they would be punished and, and thrown out and never allowed uh, to be entering. And the women were never conscious of this logic, except the gardener, like the Garden of Eden, had all the wisdom. Anyway, this is why is there another character uh, of the film who basically take refuge in the orchard because she was raped. And eventually she's brought there because she, her sense of morality was completely distorted, destroyed. And she, she came to recoup and, and face with this, um, this disgrace. Uh, and, and, well, I won't explain the film. I hope you can rent it in Netflix. Um, <laughs> Eventually, she goes back without the veil and very self-determined. And I won't tell you what happens to her in the orchard, but something does happen. Uh, and these are some of the images. As you can see, I try to keep my visual um, signature as, as an artist uh, and, and really, as much as I could, tell the story uh, with the power of the image as opposed to the words. Um, and here are some of the images of Faize now facing Munes. Munes, for me, was a, one of the most interesting characters. She was the activist among the four women. She was the one who, unlike the other women who were interested in, in somehow self-interest and issues that was more narcissistic, for her, she was the one who took us to the social political crisis of the time, as she was very curious and loved Dr. Mossadegh. And her brother would not let her be active in this process, so she throws herself off the building. She commits suicide, and only after death, this again is a magic realism uh, story, only after death she rises and becomes active as an activist. And through her, we begin to see um, some of the turmoils on the street. These are some of the images, actual shots of the street protest um, for supporting Dr. Mossadegh just before the coup. Uh, these are the things we looked at, and we recreated the coup in the streets of Casablanca in Morocco. We recreated Iran in the 1950s. And, and mind you that this coup d'etat, if I could say in this country, that this coup has been largely forgotten, both by the British and American uh, population, and, and erased even among Iranian people, uh, have almost no memory, that this was the, the most significant turning point of our modern history, political history, that perhaps we could even say that if we didn't have this coup organized by the British and Americans, we would never be where we are today. Uh, and so it's a very significant 
uh, part of the history, and I found that was really important in, to inject into the story. Um, and so we actually created some of these images in Morocco. We even got the cars and et cetera with a very, very modest um, budget. Uh, mind you that I, I was really feeling um, really frightened being one of the leaders of this project, um, dealing with a period film, an epic film, dealing with actors with tremendous experience. Uh, and, and more than anything, the producers were after making a film that had some commercial viability, that was able to do well in the box office, and yet had artistic merit. <laughs> I felt tremendous pressure and, and um, for example, one of these shots that you see here, you had seen the shots that was actual shots and archival shots, but why you can see these images that we constructed, they're very stylized. They're almost like a dance, like Rapture, in a way that you know, we, we dress the communists as white shirts, the nationalists, the, the, the army with khaki pants, uh, clothes, of course, the, the fascists, the talks in black, um, and, and so somehow then they melted into each other. So, um, and, and this is Muniz after she, she resurrected from her death and, and is among the, the crowd. Uh, finally, the, the final character is um, the most um, sort of elitist character, the most fashionable character is Farouk Lera, a very narcissistic, selfish woman in her mid-50s who wants to start life over again, who, who even though is married, dislikes her husband and wants to become an artist at an age that people usually don't pioneer a new life. And so she runs to this orchard, she buys this orchard and eventually houses the other ladies. And the complexity about her is that she was so fascinated by the West, by the idea of the salon, by the looks that she never looked within herself. And in fact, in the story we learn that after a short escape from that sense of narcissism, eventually she opens the orchard that was so sacred to the outsiders. And by doing that, breaks the spell of the orchard. And eventually, everything disintegrates. And the, spe and the, the magic of the orchard breaks down and Zarin dies. And, and so these are her in this uh, different scenes. As you can see, we, we really had to pay attention to the costumes, hair and makeup, the look of the 50s in Iran, even the music, etc. And there is this very comical moment where the orchard is finally open and, and, and where she shouldn't have and the army actually sort of rapes the orchard and that's the pivotal point where the, the outside, the city of Tehran, the history and the, the space of orchard, they, they merge together and we understand that both the orchard and the country of Iran has been raped. Finally, now I'm talking fast because there's just so much uh, in 2012, what do I do? After making six years of making a movie, I return to black and white portraits. I think I'm a little crazy, but no, I think I miss the idea, the solitary of, of, uh, of studio work, but also something profound happened to us. You mentioned something about the Arab Spring. Uh, Shoja and I have been very, very active uh, in the 2009 election in Iran, the entire uprising, the green movement. We became, for the first time, very outspoken. We were green in our inauguration of our film which it was actually open exactly during the summer of 2009. And, and there was an incredible energy that sort of invigorated all of us as Iranian people that were no longer ashamed of being artists but called activists. Uh, something profound happened to me and, and, and I think for, for all of my community that we worked with and we realized that the Arab Spring and all of the course of events are not distant from us, that actually all this social crisis or personal crisis and we are in it. There is no distance between them and us. And if something could change in Iran, it would actually affect my life. And, and so we became very active and eventually we went to Egypt and we were very involved at the Tahrir Square and we, we if not in Iran, we were able to, to be in, immersed in that energy of the Egyptians now fighting for their revolution. And um, I found now really um, a, a really big part of it. So I started to think about how could I now make a body of work that sort of captures the essence, the dignity, the, the energy of these youth who have been so willingly giving their lives uh, for their country. The sense of devotion and patriotism and love and yet brutality and violence and atrocity that comes from the people of power. In a way, this took me back to the woman of Allah. How could we, with the absolute minimal body language and gaze, 
give you the sense of mortality, emotion, fear, anxiety, yet pride and dignity, which is what I sense in every woman and man that was out there on that street fighting, whether it was in Tahrir Square or it was in Tehran. So I took it upon myself for my next exhibition at Barbara Gladstone, my first exhibition after a long time, to capture the essence of this without being didactic, without being propagandic. And let me tell you, it was an incredibly difficult task, A, to return to photography, and B, to go to this subject that was so easy to make into a cliche and obvious commentary. So I made a series of work that, as you see, there was a wall that really captured the group of people that I called the masses. These are the faces of Arab and Iranian people that I basically brought together in my studio in New York. And a group of figures, that what I call the patriots. Again, I went into that simple body language, the pledge, which is the love of country universally, obviously, and certain other body languages that to me signified that love. And finally, I used the series was called The Book of Kings, which was based on the Book of Kings. And most of you, the academics here, might know of the Book of Shahnameh by, by, by Ferdowsi, <coughs> written, I believe, in 11th century, that basically was a long epic poem about the epic tragedy that transpired by Islamic conquest in Iran. Basically, this book apparently saved Iranian language prior to the Arab conquest. What I was interested in, by capturing these contemporary faces and the writing that became contemporary literature and even journals from prison by Iranian prisoners, and yet intersecting them with images, illustrations that came directly from an ancient book that it too portrayed an idea of tragedy, but of another time. It too tried to bring together ideas of patriotism, passion, and love of, God, uh, of country, and yet brutality, and war and killing. And, and these are some of the images that are ultimately integrated. And obviously, there are people who are the villains that their body postures suggest the idea of power. There were very many. I'm just going to go super, super fast. As you can see, their gazes, their, their expressions are consistently similar in my mind. All of them, I wrote on them. I had to learn to my, again to go back to calligraphy. It was a two-year project. Uh, I'm still writing. Um, and it was a fantastic experience to come back to this after all those filmmaking experiences. Now, I'm coming to the ending. I hope I haven't exhausted you too much. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Natalie Portman last month, going back to video. And, and, and this was very odd that came to me as a commission. She's from Israel and I'm from Iran. And apparently she had an interest to do a small collaboration together. And, 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 and there it was, this fantastic star. But someone who was really a great actress who had an incredible power to deliver something psychological. We shot only two days. And, and I, without going too much in depth about this video, which I'm still editing, is really about a state of dream dream, a kind of a nightmare of a woman who, in, in, in a state of emotional crisis, sees a ghost, a sort of an angel of death that she uncontrollably follows, that takes her to the world, to the state, space of abyss. Um, this piece, again, has nothing to do with Iran, has nothing to do with any sociopolitical issues. It's something to do with me, always feeling that I'm so divided between who I am on the inside and the outside, my dreams and the reality, and my fear of death and yet my life. And so this figure becomes really an image of angel of death, that literally she uncontrollably follows her, him and enters, I'm going to go super fast, to this very strange space. Again, we blur the boundary between dream and reality, and they enter this space that is extremely dark and very frightening, and it appears like the underworld. And there she sees herself, her, her alter egos, as demonic, as fragile, as, as kind, as vulnerable, and, and, and there it's Again, she plays herself in, in both aspects. 
Uh, and, and there are other characters. To me, these are also the, the people who are no longer alive. Um, and again, this work has not been edited. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be working on it soon. But it was really a tremendous experience working with her and learning from her. But once again, this was about a source of opposites, the exterior, the in interior, the extreme overexposed beach space to extreme dark of the interior of this mansion. Finally, I'm almost finished. Um, now we're in Egypt. I've sort of shifted nomadically from Iran onto Egypt. Why Egypt? I have found um, a great fascination with Umm Kulthum, who is perhaps the most significant artist of the 20th century in the Islamic world, without a doubt. I think when she passed away, there was four million people on the streets of Cairo. For me, it's, a, it's, a, it's not about being Egyptian or anything else. I take tremendous pride that in that period in the Middle East, when she died, it was 1975, that there was a woman that was loved by men, women, rich and poor, intellectual and elite, and non-intellectuals, religious people. She was a woman who had the power of her music that was commonly known to throw people into the state of ecstasy and trance. Yet, it was a woman who got engaged in the country, helped the country, rose the spirit of the people when they were in economic depression, when they were at war with Israel, when they were defeated. And, and she never ever was tragic in a way that many of our wonderful female singers in the West are. For me, she's an unprecedented um, artist. And as a woman artist from the Middle East, I look up to her. So at the moment, together with Shoja, we have written the script. We're about to move to Egypt to live there. I've spent many trips there. We've done tremendous research about the history of modern Egypt, equal to women uh, uh, without men. We have had to inject a lot of information about the current, contemporary, and recent modern history of Egypt. So it gives me a great honor to learn and research and, and create a story that tells the story of the art and the life of this woman, as well as the country. These are some images of Umm Kulthum as she, for the first 18 years of her life, she was dressed as a boy, as it was tabooed as woman to sing. Uh, and eventually she moved to Cairo and became very wealthy uh, and very successful. And eventually the war broke out and she became very active as an activist, I suppose, a nationalist. And these are some of the iconic images. Some of you, maybe in different generation, not so young, may remember her. Um, and, and I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you and sorry for this long. Piece.